episode of the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. We talk about how taking a walk with your players can build the relationship, the three down front, creepers and man pressures, and the mindset that's necessary to really frame out your career. And joining us to talk about all those things is the defensive coordinator and secondary coach at Villanova, Ola Adams. Coach, it's been a long time. I've been trying to get you here on this podcast, so I'm excited to have you here today. Uh, hey, I'm I'm glad you uh, continued to track me down, and uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward uh, to doing this. Coach, let's let's start off by talking about your journey as a coach here, and going back to the beginning. And you know, as as you uh, were playing, or at some point in your career, you said, you know what, I'm going to be a coach. When was that? When would you do decide to be a coach, and why was it that you wanted to be a coach? Uh, the biggest thing, you know, is as we're playing college football, you know, we all think that, you know, we're going to go to the NFL. So uh, that was kind of my mentality. You know, at the time I played division two ball um, at Concord university. uh, So small school in West Virginia, you know, I actually started there for four years. I had a good career um, and I had an opportunity, you know, to continue to play. So, you know, I remember, you know, when I did a a workout, um, a local tryout with the Washington or the old, you know, the Washington football team, I should say, um, that was kind of the moment, you know, when I knew that that, you know, part of my life was done. You know, I knew that I wasn't going to make the team. Um, I knew that, you know, I I hadn't graduated from college yet. So, you know, with with my mother, you know, I had to graduate. So what I did is I went back to school um, for the fall semester. I had a semester left to finish up. And uh, basically, my college paid my tuition um, for that semester as I was a basically a student, you know, coach. So I basically assisted um, my DB coach, you know, with drills and all the things that, you know, they needed me to do around there. That's how I got my first coaching opportunity. But I didn't plan on coaching after that. Um, I went home after that semester. um, I interviewed for three jobs. Um, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, you know, I'm from that area. But uh, what happened is uh, I interviewed for the first job and I got offered the first job. Um, I remember sitting in the second interview, I did three, uh, or I was supposed to do three. I, mean, I had three schedules. The second interview, right in the middle of the interview, I remember um, the, the guy interviewing me, asking me questions. And I just had an epiphany kind of right in the middle of it that this is not what I want to do. So I ended up kind of bagging that interview. You know, I I didn't get off at that job and I canceled the third one. So I called a former coach of mine who coached me my freshman year at Concord. He was currently at that time, the defensive coordinator at at Cortland state. So I called him um, and I said, Hey coach, you know, I want to get into coaching. So that was around January, February of, of, that year and he said hey you know I'll do my best to get you here you just gotta wait and hang on until until June that's when the school's gonna uh, start hiring again so that's how I got my first opportunity was from a former coach of mine Um, and ever since then you know it's kind of taken off. I know before we got going you talked about the different experiences you had you were safety in college but you were forced to coach some other positions as you grew in this profession and in your words uh, do some things that were uncomfortable for you how did those experiences make you a better coach uh the reality for me you know I I just like I like to be challenged you know even if I'm good at something I want to be challenged you know I want to try to be the best at, at what I'm doing so you know at the end of the day you know like you said I played safety I played corner that's what I'm used to um, that's what I was coaching when I first started out, but, you know, my mindset shifted quickly my first year coaching. So I'll kind of tell you a quick story. Um, we were out at practice when I was the DB coach at Cortland back in 09. And, uh, we had a unique week. We played a team called uh, Montclair state. Uh, they ran a ton of empty. So basically we scrapped our skeleton period and we did an empty period instead. And what that entailed was me actually having to draw protection, you know, so me coming out of college, I could draw a scaly. That was easy, but man, did I screw up those protections? 
all right? And my head coach runs those cards. So right in the middle of the practice, um, he just stops, you know, because he couldn't figure out what the heck I put on paper. He's like, Ola, what the heck is this? He said, I can't read this. He said, I don't know where these guys are supposed to go. Like, it was probably the most embarrassing moment I've had in coaching. But it was also the greatest moment I had, you know, because he's a great coach. You know, he pulled me in afterwards and just told me, he said, if you don't know what you're doing, just ask. And that, that floored me. I just sat back in my chair and I'm like, you know what? I was trying to figure it out. I should have just asked. You know, it was, it was like an epiphany moment. So right from that moment, me and him sat down and he taught me pass protection. So here I am, you know, I'm 22 years old, learning pass protection. It, it totally changed my mentality. I stopped focusing on the defensive backfield and I started to see the big picture. You know, it really opened up a can of worms for me and allowed me to start creating a playbook. So when I got hired at uh, Glenville State the next year, while I was there, that's when I started having like more of a defensive coordinator mentality. You know, before I left, I said, hey, I want to be the youngest coordinator in the country. That's what I told him. Um, and when I went to Glenville State, I started building a playbook and just in my mind getting ready for that opportunity to be one. And, uh, you know, it just so happened I got an opportunity the following year. So, you know, when I was 24, I got hired at, at Cortland as the D.C. And that, that made me totally uncomfortable. Like, yes, I wanted it. But, I mean, I was young, you know, and still figuring things out. So that was a heck of an experience, really growing within that job. Um, after Cortland, you know, having the mentality of trying to move up in this profession, you know, I took a wide receiver job, you know, at, at Columbia. And um, I never, I've never coached receivers. The last time I was around receivers is when I played it in high school. So, you know, going to coach receivers, um, what I did was I reached out to – maybe three people. I know Dave Warner was at Michigan State. I had a connection to him. You know, he helped me out. Uh, I know Terrence Samuel helped me out. You know, a few guys helped me out. So I kind of got their manuals and things of that, you know, and I put it together and made one of my own. And I just kind of went to the receiver job with confidence, you know, and just did the best that I could. Um, and then the next job I took at Villanova was coaching running back. You know, I've never coached running backs. I haven't played running back since Little League. So, um, again, by, by now I was starting to be comfortable being uncomfortable, knowing and having the confidence that I could coach any position. I just needed to get the information, you know, have a chance to kind of figure it out and then, and then go after it. So, um, even at Villanova, I mean, I got promoted to special teams coordinator. Uh, when I got here, I've never done special teams. So, Having an offensive and a defensive background really helped me um, coach special teams, you know, because I wasn't great at coaching kickers, but I could do about everything else. So, you know, special teams allows you to kind of move into that role of I, I kind of felt like a head coach. You know, I got to get up in front of the team every day. Um, I got to manage the roster because anybody who's a special teams coordinator knows, um, you know, that that is a – you know, that's a heck of a job to, to to take care of. I can only imagine what that looks like during COVID. But, um, no, you know, I, I love the opportunity to be uncomfortable because it gives you the biggest chance to learn. And that's what I love doing. You know, I kind of look at myself as a lifelong learner. So, you know, whatever makes me uncomfortable, you know, I know in my heart that I can do the job. So that gives me confidence to get it done. And I know for you – you said really it's that mindset um, for you. It was kind of like a just a, a, a realization of this is what I got to gonna this is what I'm gonna do. This is what I want to do. Here's where I want to go. And you know, to me, you, before we got going, you mentioned it as something that really has helped framed out your career. When you know you you focus more on that mindset and you know forget about you know oh I got to be in this job or that job that has really made a difference in you being able to get to where you're at right now? Oh, no doubt. Uh, you know, it's a hard business. You know, uh, a lot of people, you know, the, the room next to me right now, I mean, I got a volunteer, you know, assistant. He works as hard as anybody. You know, I mean, uh, I made $6,000 my first job. 
you know, and as I started moving up in in this business, you know, nobody knows how much money you make, you know, they just know that you're coaching college football, you know, and that's wonderful. But at, at the end of the day, you know, when you're making $6,000, you know, it makes you think a lot of things, you know, should I still be doing this? I got a college degree. I can go make 50000 That's what my mom was telling me. And I said, Mom, I got this. You know, like, I could be great at this. And uh, kind of what happened my first year at Cortland, um, I asked my head coach if I could break into New Jersey and New York City to recruit because we weren't recruiting those areas hard at the time. And I kind of, you know, did a good job down there. But, you know, D3 football, we didn't have hotel money. I stayed at my friend's house that works on Wall Street. You know, so this guy had, you know, I'm not going to say too much about him, but he makes a ton of money. And I was making $6,000. So he's taking me out to eat. And I'm sitting here uncomfortable again, you know, saying, whoa, like, should I be doing this so I could live this kind of lifestyle? Um, but so I asked him, um, like, what his goals were in this in the financial profession. And uh, I asked him, I said, should I be doing that? And he just said, hey, man, he said, he just sat back and he said, hey, man, you know, just keep doing what you love. You know, eventually you're going to make uh, a ton of money, you know, if you're good at it. And that that's something that has stuck with me. Um, and, and also just having the experience, I went to uh, Don Bosco to recruit uh, back in 09 and they sat me down. I'm a D3 coach with like 10 guys. So, you know, I'm in here yucking it up and talking, you know, to these guys. We we had a great time, great conversation. I really walked out of that room feeling euphoric, honestly. And I, I called my head coach and I said, hey, coach, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I feel like that was my moment where my mindset changed. I stopped worrying about how much money I was making. You know, I stopped worrying about how many hours we were working. I just I just went all in. You know, because I know, you know, mentally, if you're all in on something, you can accomplish it. But if you're kind of halfway in, worrying about the money and stuff like that, like people, friends who used to tell me, man, I don't make enough. I'm going to get out. That gave me confidence because I knew no matter what, I was going to be a coach. So I I think the mindset's important in this business to just get into it uh, for the right reasons. And it's for the players. And if you end up making a ton of money, then good for you. But I could do this for free, honestly. That's how I feel. So you mentioned the players, and I know for you, building relationships are such an important part of this. And, you know, I I thought it was really neat when you said to me, one of the things you do and you've done recently is to take walks with your players, especially as we're in the situation where it's about social distancing, you know, not being inside of – a room and a small room, et cetera. But, you know, and I, I pointed out to you, it reminded me of things I heard about uh, of guys who would do that, guys like Aristotle, Charles Darwin, Steve Jobs, who would walk and have walking meetings. And there's actually some signs behind it that um, the, that kind of thing uh, really builds a bond, builds the engagement different than just sitting there in a room. And you found it to be very effective for you here Uh, as we faced COVID and, you know, you're working at different ways to build relationships with your players. Talk to us a little bit about why you did that and how it's worked out for you. Yeah, I'll be honest, you know, how it started was like, there's a lot of uncertainty coming back, you know, around August last year, uh, COVID was kind of raging out of control. And, And to be honest, I wanted to do everything outside when we first got back, you know, I wanted to meet with players outside I didn't want to be inside that much personally. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. Um, so what we did is we started meeting with the guys outside and just doing as much as we could outside. Um, but, you know, I've never had a lot of time in the fall because we're always playing and, and we didn't get to play this fall. So here we are with, with a ton of time at, at like, 11 a.m. You know, I've never been free at 11 a.m. my whole career. So I just started um, – you know, just scheduling a player a day, you know, to, to come take a walk with me, you know, cause over COVID, um, over the quarantine is when I first started w- going on walks. First time in my life that I started going out on walks and it, d- it did a number on me, you know, just clearing my mind and, and, and just 
did some little wonders for me. So I would tell my players, you know, hey, man, you guys should go on walks. And uh, one player asked me if he can go on the walk with me. And, and that's kind of how it started. You know, me and the first walk we took, we probably walked maybe a couple miles from the campus. We were gone for a couple hours. You know, we just found a nice field and just kind of sat there and talked, you know. So at the end of the day, um, every walk that I take, you know, with different players is different. You know, I'll tell you one walk. Um, I took a true freshman that I recruited. Um, you know, we're in a nice area at Villanova. So, you know, I kind of depart on the same path and then I veer off some way, somewhere along the way. And uh, this time, you know, I made a right instead of making a left, and here we are, boom, right at a, right at a Ferrari dealership, right? So, <laughs> you know, so I see the guy that works at the Ferrari dealership outside. I said, hey, man, uh, I said, hey, can we come in? And uh, he said, yeah, you know, because he could see we were Villanova people. And um, so me and this player, we walk in the Ferrari dealership, and, and I get a picture uh, of the kid in front of the Ferrari, and I send it to the kid. And, and now I call him Ferrari, you know? So it's it's like, that's like a priceless moment, um, an inspirational moment, you know? If you're a college 18-year-old standing in front of a Ferrari, you know, uh, having, a having you know, just a random walk with your defensive coordinator, you know, I really just wanted to show those guys, you know, honestly, how much I love them, you know, how invested I am in them. Um, I wanted every individual to feel important. You know, it's very hard right now to get on a Zoom call with the whole defense and make everybody feel like they're being touched. Right. You, you got me? So at the end of the day, you know, taking one guy out at a time, even if other guys saw me take one guy out, they, they look at it and they say, coach is trying to do something to get to know us. And um, I just think, you know, that that's important because, number one, it opens up the lines of communication. Some of these players told me things that I did not know. So, like, as a coach sometimes, like, we think we know what's going on with the players, but we also know we don't know everything. But, like, they volunteered some information to me. You know, some were personal information that was between me and them. I couldn't, I can't even tell my head coach some of the things that were said. But that's the, the sacredness of our relationship. So, um, just given um, all the players the ability to feel comfortable um, around me that I'm just like them, you know, I always try to make sure that they understand, you know, that I'm just like them um, and we're, we're in this together. Um, I don't always want them to see me in a coaching role. I just want to be able to walk and relax, you know, and, and have a conversation and be, you know, friends or mentor and mentee, you know, but when you're always doing football, you know, that doesn't work today. You know, you got to get these kids to love you, and then they'll run through a wall for you. But if they don't love you, then football is irrelevant. They're not going to play hard for you, or they're going to transfer and leave, or, you know, everybody knows what's going on. So, you know, I really want to uh, just make sure that I'm doing everything that I can uh, to build, you know, the best relationship I can, you know, with as many players as I can, because, you know, it's hard to – to touch every single person, but, you know, we do the best that we can. It's one of those things that and you and I were talking about, just Lauren's first and goal this year and, and the incredible clinic that we just had. And we, we're we going to get to your talk a little bit later, but um, those things that have been maybe positives, that, that COVID has forced us to think differently, um, it's forced us to be better in different ways. And, and so, you know, you might not have done this, had it not been for COVID, but you know, your thoughts on continuing to do this afterwards, is, is it something you feel is, is really worthwhile in building the relationship? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, one thing about what's going on with COVID is we learned a lot of things. Um, like, like we did our best year of recruiting. The kids didn't get to come to the campus. I mean, but we really, did the best job of surrounding recruits as we could and getting to their parents. And we, we've done the best job that we've done since that baby recruited. And we didn't even get to go out and we didn't get to, uh, we didn't get to, to meet the, the recruits in person, you know? So it's like, you just got to be creative during COVID. And it's like, 
I think you'd be crazy not to continue some of the things that you've learned over uh, this quarantine, you know, like as far as coaches, you know, do we need to, do we need to be on the road the whole time? You know, I, I, I just don't know because we got a lot more done from our computers and on our phone uh, than when you're spent at the end of the day, just only going to seven schools. So um, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, going to do my best to continue uh, walking with the players. I would say probably in the springtime, you know, for in spring ball would be the best time, you know, in season stuff, but you know, you got to figure out how to get that done because that's very important, you know, for your relationship moving forward. So, so I'm definitely, you know, I learned a lot of things over uh, this quarantine that we want to try to continue um, as we move forward. Coach, I know when we look at some of the things you do out on the field uh, and things you get asked about quite a bit, you got you really love and have become known for the three down front. Uh, what are some of the, the keys for you to being successful with that front? I know it's become popular. And I go out and watch games all the time on Friday nights or on TV. And like anything, works for some people and doesn't work for others. There's always a key to making it work. For you, what is the key to successfully using the three down front? I really, uh, you know, I really think it it comes down, you know, to just using the personnel that you have. And um, everywhere I've been that I've ran a three down front, you know, my first time running a three down front, I mean, we, we ran it, you know, back when I was a coordinator back in at Cortland from 2011 to 2013. And we were thin up front, you know, we didn't have the biggest D line. Um, so we had to use a lot more movement uh, than I'd like to say uh, today, you know, today we got a lot bigger guys up front so we could play the four eye and, and hang in there on some double teams and things of that nature and really eat up the blockers in front of us. But uh, in movement, uh, like we were doing back in the day, probably wouldn't be our strength. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what what the three down front gives you is the opportunity to be flexible. You know, you don't have to be a two gap, you know, type three down front. You don't have to be a movement type. You know, you could kind of mix it up and, and really use your personnel uh, to your strength. So, I really think the biggest thing there is, is, you know, you, again, like I said, using the personnel to your strength. And it's hard to defend some of these spread offenses in a four-down front. So we, we, you know, transitioned to a three-down front back in 2009 because we saw where the game was going. So, you know, I just think it's a good starting point. You know, if you want to really have a chance to, you know, match up with these spread offenses and, and things of that nature to just at least start with a three down structure um, and then figure out, you know, how you could fill it in to fit your team. And I know you said you were using them before they were actually named it, but creepers are a part of this for you too, right? Those simulated uh, blitzes being able to show pressure over here and then drop out or drop a different guy out. Um, Talk to us a little bit about how, how that's a part of, you know, what you guys are doing with your three down. Yeah, so back in uh, when I was coordinator at Cortland, 2011 through 13, you know, like I said, I was young and I, I had a lot to learn. But what I was able to do is just be creative, you know. My coach really gave me creative freedom. And we started studying certain things like in a three down front, if you have a zero nose, how much pressure is he getting? Is he ever getting to the quarterback? You know, how many sacks did he get? And the, and the answer is anybody who has a zero shade nose guard knows that they're not getting anywhere in pass protection because there's going to be at least three people, guard, center guard, that are, you know, potentially going to be there to stop them. But you can do some things on the outside. All right. But uh, so what we, you know, something simple that we used to do, you know, we don't do as much movement today like we did back then. Like I said, the game has changed. But, you know, back then we were using a ton of movement. Um, so what we wanted to do um, was, number one, I think when you talk creepers, I think the number one thing to understand is you got to understand protection. You got to understand, uh, you got to have a goal. Like my goal is simple. 
you know, uh, my goal is simple. The, the reality is that, you know, the offense, you know, can, can we keep that running back in and defend four wide receivers? That, that, I mean, that's my thing because, you know, let's say, you know, you don't run a creeper, but you just bring, let's say, four people, all right? Uh, if you just bring four people, the back can still check and get out on its route. But if you run a creeper, you can send a guy off the edge and drop out the nose guard, and the back can't get out. So now you're actually gaining a guy in coverage, you know, and, and, and having better numbers. So I really look at it from a real simplistic standpoint. You know, what is the protection? All right. How do we send somebody outside of the realm of that protection potentially? I mean, sometimes we don't, but a lot of times we do. How, how can we send a guy outside of the, of the primary protection to make sure that the back has to pick him up? All right. And then we say if the back doesn't pick him up, then that guy should get a free run at the quarterback. All right. So that's what, you know, we did a lot. But I know back at Cortland, you know, uh, we did a lot of three, a lot of three man creepers, you know, believe it or not, because we would run a three man front, let's say, and we would, let's say, bring a guy off to, I mean, I could tell you the communications we had because we don't use it anymore, but, you know, our weak side backer, um, we'd make a wind call. And then our field strong safety, we'd make a flood call. So you got wind and flood, an easy way to send a guy off the edge. All right. So if we call it flood, we could tag spy in front of it. So if I call it spy flood, we would bring uh, we would bring our strong safety off the edge to the field and we drop our nose guard out. All right. So we were getting a lot of one on one matchups with that with that blitzer and the running back. Mm -hmm. And we were dropping the nose out to kind of, you know, spy. And if the quarterback broke the pocket or anything like that, he was able to add in and actually attack the quarterback now instead of being caught up between the A and B gaps, right. doing nothing, all right? Um, and he also was dropping out. He helped us on some screen plays. We made an interception. He helped on some shallow crossers. You know, every week we tried to tell him, like, hey, you know, if you're dropping out this week, this is what, you know, we're looking for, you know, this is what we're looking for. It's a running quarterback, so we want you to spy him. Uh, the next week, hey, they run a ton of screens. We really need you to hang in there and sift that out. Um, they run a lot of crosses, you know. Can you be a little bit of interference for us there? We even had a defense where our uh, strong side end would drop out and take the crosser from the opposite side of the field. So, you know, there's a lot of different things we did. You know, I know I mentioned uh, wind and, uh, flood and wind. We even combined both. We call it spy flood wind. So that's your double-edged pressure, dropping out the nose. You know, we ran trap coverage you know, behind it. So there, there's a lot of different things that we were doing, but the way we were doing them was just uh, today we're trying to modernize it more than anything. You know, we had to put a lot of tags on our calls back in the day. Like if we ran a fire zone, you know, we had a call where we could drop out our nose guard spy, or we'd make a call to drop out the backs in away from the, the pressure, you know, so it'd be a four man focused pressure if it was America's fire zone, and we'd drop out the backside in. So, again, we were able to eat up the back, and we were able to gain a guy in coverage a ton, all right? So, you know, the biggest thing uh, we're trying to do here this year is, is really make sure that we educate our kids on pass protection. So, you know, we got a system. We just call it pass pro for dummies. You know, it's a way that I teach our guys pass protection. Again, I'm offensive. I've coached offense, right? So I tell them exactly how we count it, you know. And uh, number one rule, you know, if if, if you're an offensive lineman, you got to block the guys who are on the line of scrimmage. That that's the number one rule. So you know, if you got three down, they got they're going to block those three down. If you got four down, they're going to block the linemen are going to block those four down. So other than that, you just got to figure out how to get to the quarterback and uh, how you can uh, how you can waste you know an offensive lineman. So, you know, I think there's a ton of different ways, you know, to get that done. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that you brought up, you know, coaching up those guys, not to just drop, but exactly what they're going to face each week. And and as I mentioned, as you know, as I go out and watch different teams, 
try to do these things, it's all in the attention to detail. So you could see, you know, in particular where there is that guy who knows, all right, I'm dropping out. Here's the couple things I need to look for uh, in my responsibilities, and that guy's going to play well versus the, the guy who's just been taught you drop out on this, right? It's something that week to week you have to school those guys up on. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I hate to get locked in and just say this guy's doing this. You know, all you have is the quarterback. I, I don't like doing that, you know, because some of, some of the quarterbacks are statues. You know, I know they're not going anywhere. You know, if they're running a lot of shallow crosses, I mean, you can get some interference there. there there's so much that a guy in the low hole can do for you other than just spying the quarterback. You know, he could do that and much more. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you just frame it um, around, you know, what you're seeing. You got to make sure you got guys, you know, that are semi-comfortable doing it, you know. But I'm going to be honest. I've dropped out some of the worst <laughs> nose guards, you know, and they still made plays, and they have fun. They like it. They enjoy it. And in this day and age, they better like and enjoy what they're doing or they're not going to want to play. So, you know, there's a little bit of fun in there too. Uh, but like I said, when you educate the players, like our my middle linebacker here, I mean, there's no player in the country that spends more time with his coaches you know, than this kid or watches more film than this guy. So I'm able to talk to him about pass protection to where he can teach other people pass protection now. He knows exactly why we're doing certain blitzes. He knows who's going who's gonna to get picked up by who, you, you know. So now, you, you know, once you know uh, what, what these creepers do as well is get you, get you one-on-ones. And if you know who, who you're going against, that makes it more effective because you only have a hair longer before the offensive lineman realizes somebody dropped out and he has to redirect. So at the end of the day, you know, educating those guys on, all right, when we run this field creeper and we long stick you in, you're going to be one-on-one uh, with that guard. You got two-way go. You know, you know what I mean? It just makes a world of difference when you can really educate these guys and let them know. Um, hey, if we're in an even front, you know, if we just shave uh, a nose guard into a two eye, the center's probably gonna gonna slide the protection that way. You, you know, like there's certain things uh, that we can educate them on. Hey, there's two threes, two nines. Uh, the center's gonna wiggle. Y- you know, I mean, it, it, you know, I don't want to <laughs> tell exactly how we're teaching everything, but but you know, again. Um, our guys know exactly who they're going against. And that's what's going to, in turn, make them more effective players. Well, going to the back end of the defense, uh, another thing you really have become known for is your press man coverage. Um, you know, kind of proof that you've been able to do that well is you have three guys in the league right now in the last three years. Um, again, details are everything, the techniques, everything. It's something you talked about at Lawrence first and goal. You're, Talk was about defensive back fundamentals. For you, what are the keys to being able to play that press man coverage effectively? Um, So before I I talk about that, I think, you know, you asked a question in the past about my prior experience. So I'll tell anybody on the call this, you know, coaching defensive backs before I coach wide receivers, I played press and I like playing it. Um, But when I coach wide receivers, it made me realize how hard it is to teach somebody else how to get off of press coverage because I'm twitchy. I can get off of it naturally. I don't need anybody to really teach me. Um, But me trying to teach slower twitch players and things like that at Columbia, I'm like, oh, my God. These kids really cannot do it. They cannot get off of the press. So I said, man, when I go back on defense, we're going to be up in people's faces. You know, that was – it's a great moment, you know, uh, when you're coaching a position, but it's not yours naturally to be able to take advantage of it on the other side. But, you know, th- there's things that we look for. We try to recruit taller and longer guys. So, you know, a lot of our guys got long arms. Um, long arms definitely help, you know, in press coverage. It, it helps keep the uh, wide receivers, you know, body away and separated from yours. You know, press coverage is a little bit harder. For guys with shorter arms, they got to line up tighter to the line of scrimmage. All right. So, yeah, you know, I think, you you know, obviously, you know, having 
you know, long arms helps and, and having good feet. You also, you know, for us, uh, we, we incorporate a lot of talk about playing basketball, you know. So if you, you know, play other sports or things of that nature, we always try to bring that in, you know, to our teaching as far as we call our press man technique, we call it basketball, you know. So, you know, working on cutoff angles and, and things of that nature. Uh, but no, you know, I think, you know, really just teaching kids to be patient, you know, at the line of scrimmage, you know, we want to crowd the line of scrimmage as much as we can. We want to have two options the way we play press, we play hard press, we play soft press. All right. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, leaving a little bit of flexibility, you know, in there for those guys to, to really create their own, you know, flavor, their own mentality. There's certain things that we're, we're reading, you know, so for instance, you know, eye placement, you know, we're eyes neutral in the belt buckle, you know, we try to correct the, the seat of the wide receiver. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's something there that we're looking for, you know, to help us in our movement and how we're going to react. So, you know, depending on what technique we're playing, you have to be able to pair it with what coverage you're actually playing as well. You know, do I have help? Do I not have help? Is the ball coming out now? Um, or are we not running pressure? Should I play hard press at the line? Should I play soft press? You know, if I'm playing, uh, let's say, two man, and I know I have safety help over the top, then I'm going to play hard press. If I have one high safety in the middle, am I funneling and forcing uh, the guys that I'm covering? you know, to to that middle safety, you know, am I playing that safety, middle safety in the post? Am I playing them more shallow? There's a lot of, you know, different things that details that we have to know here um, in order to, to be effective in man coverage. But, you know, all the guys that we take, you know, can run, you know, have the ability to be able to play like corner and safety. They've had experience playing a lot of these guys have had experience playing man to man in high school but the the reality of what I have found is that you know taking a wide receiver you know that has good feet you know that 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 plays physical even on offense you know I've taken some of those guys and they have been just that successful so you know at the end of the day you know it's really really a mixed bag I mean most guys we got around six feet but you know, I got a 5'10 guy now that's a little faster and he got great feet. So, you know, it's hard to get on top of those guys. So, you know, I would just say simply, you know, playing soft press, we want to stay on top of the receiver as long as we can. Um, playing hard press, we want to dictate, you know, where the receiver is going. So, you know, those are some educational things that kind of help us be successful here playing press man. Coach, uh, talked about some great things on and off the field, things that have helped you build your career here. But looking at all you do as a coach, what's the one thing you do that you feel really gives your players the winning edge? I mean, again, you know, I I really believe this thing comes down to relationships, you know, no matter what. And we really, we're like placing, trying to work a philosophy of, of, making sure that they're grateful for where they're at. Um, You know, a lot of people are always, especially these days, whether it's coaches looking for the next job or players looking for the next school, you know, we just try to make sure that they know um, that everything that they want in life can be accomplished, you know, right from here. So, you know, even as a coach, I know coming to Villanova has really slowed, slowed me down mentally as far as, where I'm trying to go in my career. You know, I really enjoy it here. You know, have a great quality of life. And, you know, I'm around, you know, great staff. You know, I love, love the defensive staff I, I get to work with, you know, head coach and offensive staff. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think it's important just to make the big time where you are, you know, kind of be where your feet are, you know, do a great job wherever you're at. And uh, I think, you know, once you do that, you know, people take notice and, uh you know, if you're doing a great job, people are going to want to hire you. But, um, you know, I've just never been been one to, to really call people and things like that. I really want the, the merit of what I'm doing um, and accomplishing to be able to put me in the positions to be able to have those opportunities. But, 
you know, whether no matter what side you're on, whether you're a player or coach, you know, you got to be, you know, where your feet are. You got to make the best out of where you're at um, because there's, there's people chomping at the bit to have the opportunity that I have. You know, so I, I never take it for granted. You know, it actually pushes me and motivates me to, to work harder every day. So, you know, it's just the humility, you know, I think can take you a long way in this business, no matter what side you're on. For our listeners, you can find his talk, his clinic talk, uh, Defensive Back Fundamentals from Lawrence First and Goal on CoachTube. We'll share the link in our show notes, which you can find in your podcast app description of this show, as well as at coachandcoordinator.com. Coach, what's the best way for our listeners to contact you to to be able to learn more and maybe even uh, share a guy that they have with you? Um, the best way um, to reach me is probably on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Coach Ola Adams, so Coach O L A um, Adams. Probably the best way to reach me on my email is also on our school's uh, staff directory on the website. I got a long first name, uh, so I'd imagine, you know, the best bet for you would be to go online and (laughs) and copy and paste that one. All right. But um, other other than email, I would say Twitter for sure. And what are the areas that you recruit? Um, You know, I'm from, uh, I was born in Virginia. You know, my mom lives in Maryland now, so you know, right now I'm recruiting a DMV, you know, but, uh, you know, I've recruited up and down the East coast, uh, I've recruited LA, I've recruited Atlanta, you know, so at the end of the day, you know, wherever the players are, that's where I am. Well, coach, I appreciate your time and and join us here. Like I said, uh, been a while, you and I have been back and forth, but we were finally able to get this thing done. And, and uh, I'm excited what you had to share with our listeners today. I appreciate you having me. I think you're doing a great job, you know, giving a voice to the coaches. Um, I know we all appreciate it. So, you know, thanks a lot, you know, for not giving up on on us hooking up. and, And hopefully, you know, this thing comes together well. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the coaching coordinator podcast that's at coachandcoordinator.com and follow me on twitter at coach k grabowski